Hemodynamics. This course is an introduction to hemodynamics. In this course, we will define hemodynamics and review why hemodynamics are important. We will also learn how to best use some of the newer hemodynamics assessments, such as fluid responsiveness in clinical practice. Hemo means blood, and dynamics refers to flow. Hence, hemodynamics is the study of blood flow. Understanding basic hemodynamics principles is key to understanding blood flow, and of course blood flow is critical to tissue perfusion, oxygenation, and life itself. Optimized hemodynamics enable optimal tissue perfusion. So we agree that adequate tissue oxygenation and perfusion are important. Clinically, how do we measure and assess perfusion? Blood pressure is, of course, our primary bedside measure of perfusion. As long as the mean arterial pressure, MAP, is greater than 65, or systolic blood pressure, SPP, is greater than 90, we generally assume that each organ bed will auto-regulate its own blood flow, providing adequate tissue perfusion to meet the tissue's metabolic needs. Biomarkers such as lactate or SVO2 are additional measures, which, if abnormal, may indicate inadequate tissue perfusion. Clinicians sometimes also look directly at organ function to assess signs of inadequate perfusion. For example, kidney function and urine output, or coronary ischemia. Ultimately, perfusion is all about oxygen delivery and removal of waste product and toxins. Adequate hemoglobin and oxygen saturation are, of course, critical for adequate tissue oxygen delivery. Some clinicians like to include these concepts when assessing hemodynamics and like to use oxygen delivery calculations. As the bedside clinician, it is important to understand how we are assessing tissue perfusion. Is it blood pressure or a combination of measures including biomarkers, organ function, or O2 delivery measures? This assessment should determine when we start, change, and stop therapy. It also determines how the bedside clinician will gauge whether or not the treatment to improve perfusion is effective. If you stop and think about it, a key aspect of critical care medicine is all about monitoring and managing perfusion by optimizing hemodynamics. Monitoring and managing hemodynamics is foundational to critical care medicine. A good understanding of a patient's hemodynamic status allows clinicians to use fluid management and various medications to optimize a patient's hemodynamic picture. We have several key tools and approaches we can use to optimize hemodynamics and perfusion. As we mentioned, blood pressure, or MAP, is often our primary method of assessing perfusion. When perfusion or blood pressure is abnormal, advanced hemodynamics can be very helpful to determine and balance the appropriate therapy. Today, we have three primary approaches to maintaining or improving perfusion. First, we typically ensure there is adequate intravascular blood volume or preload to the ventricle, which we can treat with IV fluid. This is usually our first line of therapy. IV fluid is considered to be inexpensive and can be given in nearly every hospital location. When effective, additional IV fluid increases cardiac stroke volume and cardiac output. More on this later. Certainly, if hemoglobin is low, you would consider blood transfusion at this step as well. Second, we ensure that the vascular tone or afterload is adequate. If vascular tone is abnormal, we can treat with either vasopressors or vasodilators. Third, we ensure that the heart is pumping adequately. If the cardiac output is abnormal, inotropes or further diagnostic tests, such as echo, may be indicated. As we mentioned, IV fluid is normally our first course of therapy. It is important to assess whether or not that therapy is effective before moving on to vasopressors and inotropes. In reality, with severely unstable patients, we may use all three therapies closely together. However, it is important as you stabilize patients to think about the impact of each separate therapy. As we mentioned on the previous slide, when considering IV fluid as therapy, Careful consideration must be given, however, to ensure that giving fluids will be effective therapy. Will giving IV fluid actually increase perfusion by increasing the volume of blood pumped from the left ventricle, the stroke volume? Is the patient still on the ascending limb of their starling curve? Will additional fluid help or harm? We have been asking this very basic question at the bedside for a long time. Over the years, 
clinicians have been searching for better ways to answer this question. Blood pressure has been measured for over 100 years. While blood pressure is a good general guide to ensuring adequate organ perfusion, we know that blood pressure poorly reflects changes in cardiac output. This is because blood pressure is so heavily influenced by arterial tone and arterial capacitance. Under normal conditions, the arterial tree may be able to accommodate additional flow or cardiac output with very little change in pressure. Therefore, small changes in stroke volume and cardiac output from a fluid bolus often will not translate to an increase in blood pressure. Also under extreme stress or high-dose vasopressors, blood pressure may be maintained with very little forward flow or cardiac output. Today, we know that blood pressure is a poor predictor of cardiac output and stroke volume. Central venous pressure, or CVP, was considered a step forward from blood pressure and has been monitored for years. However, as a preload measure, we've always known that CVP is a long way from the left ventricle, easily impacted by right ventricle problems or pulmonary abnormalities. In the 1970s, with the introduction of the Swan-Gans catheters, we began to also measure pulmonary wedge pressure as a proxy for left atrial pressure. Pressure measurements have very basic limitations when being used to assess volume, which we will return to. More recently, ECHO can measure diastolic volumes directly. However, this technology can be challenging to use, and while useful for spot checks, ECHO is not amenable to continuous monitoring. New technology, such as the CHEETAH, which allows us to continually measure LV stroke volume non-invasively, allows us to actually measure dynamic changes in ventricular volume. Clinicians can now directly see if additional fluid will increase cardiac stroke volume. This is the whole concept behind dynamic measures, challenging the heart with fluid and assessing whether or not fluid will increase cardiac output. More on this later. Let's spend a little time on CVP and pressure measures as many clinicians still like to include them in care. Measuring pressure is relatively easy and is what we've used for years to assess volume in the form of central venous pressure or pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. However, when measuring pressure and making inferences about preload or volume, it is important to understand the relationship between pressure and volume. Pressure times compliance equals volume. For changes in pressure, CVP to reflect changes in RV volume or preload, compliance must remain constant or unchanged. This is a key point. Let me reinforce this point. For changes in pressure, CVP to reflect changes in RV volume or preload, compliance must remain constant or unchanged. Compliance can be a hard concept to understand. As an example, think of a child's balloon. When empty, the compliance is really low. The system is stiff. A large pressure of breath is required to inflate the balloon only a small amount. As the balloon fills, it gets easier and easier to put in larger volumes. Compliance is increasing. For the venous system, compliance actually decreases with filling. The system becomes more stiff, sort of like a hot air balloon. This can be seen on echo or when looking at venous compliance curves. Large amounts of volume are often accommodated before pressure or CVP changes. Hence, at best, CVP is a late indicator of volume. Additionally, vascular compliance and cardiac compliance change with sympathetic tone, catecholamines, drugs, and many other factors. Mechanical ventilation, PEEP, and right ventricular functional changes are also known to impact central venous pressure measurements, making them more difficult to interpret. Bottom line, today we know that venous compliance does not stay constant, severely limiting the use of pressure as a proxy for volume. Recent studies have borne this out. CVP is known to be a poor predictor of venous volume. Recent meta-analyses have also demonstrated that CVP is a very poor predictor of LV fluid responsiveness. An initial analysis was performed in 2008 and another analysis was done in 2013, which included 1,802 patients in over 43 studies. The receiver operator curve, a statistical analysis of test usefulness, was 0.56. Basically, using CVP to predict fluid responsiveness is no better than flipping a coin. While CVP does tell the clinician the right atrial pressure, 
This information is not helpful in predicting whether or not the patient will increase cardiac output with additional IV fluid. As we were taught in school, the CVP is a long way from the left ventricle. Today, with new ways of monitoring stroke volume non-invasively, we can now directly answer the question clinicians have been asking for years. Will additional fluid increase cardiac stroke volume? We now have a direct answer. Practically, there are now several ways to directly challenge the heart with additional volume to see whether or not the heart will increase its stroke volume or cardiac output. Performing a passive leg raise will typically move 250 to 300 cc of blood from the legs and abdomen to the heart, providing an adequate fluid bolus to challenge the heart's ability to respond. An advantage of the PLR is that it is reversible and no extraneous fluid is actually administered. When the legs are lowered, the blood volume is redistributed. While generally very reliable, if for some reason adequate blood volume is not returned to the heart with the passive leg raise, the PLR could provide a false negative result. This may occur in patients with venous compression stockings, on high-dose pressors, with increased intra-abdominal pressure, or amputees. If this test is positive, a stroke volume index increase of greater than 10%, it is highly predictive that a fluid bolus of 500 cc of fluid will increase the cardiac output by 15% or more. Instead of a passive leg raise, 250 to 300 cc of IV fluid, 3 to 5 cc per kilogram, can be rapidly bolused over 5 to 10 minutes as a direct fluid bolus test to assess the ventricle's ability to respond to additional fluid. This test is reliable and if positive, is highly predictive that an additional fluid bolus of 500 cc will result in increased perfusion by increasing the cardiac output by 15% or more. Additionally, trending therapy will allow a clinician to monitor stroke volume, assessing the therapeutic impact of volume and or pressors, and identify early trends during patient care. Is the stroke volume trending up or down? If additional fluid is being bolused, is stroke volume increasing? Is perfusion being improved? Is the patient fluid responsive? Passive leg raise technique, used with the Cheetah technology, has been shown to predict fluid responsiveness with excellent results with high specificity and sensitivity. A recent study in hemodynamically unstable patients, including patients in sepsis, showed excellent agreement when compared to carotid Doppler. This included patients on vasopressors and mechanical ventilation. Why is it important to check fluid responsiveness prior to giving fluid? Today, many studies have shown that only approximately one half of hypotensive patients actually increase cardiac output with additional volume. For the other half, fluid therapy does not increase perfusion or increase cardiac stroke volume. In these non-responsive patients, additional IV fluid may increase lung water, increase interstitial third spacing, or simply increase cardiac filling pressures. The only way that a clinician can know whether a patient is fluid responsive is through a reliable dynamic fluid assessment, such as PLR, fluid bolus, or trending therapy. Assessing fluid responsiveness is now considered evidence-based best practice. So what does it mean if a patient is not fluid responsive? Typically, this means they are on the flat part of their Starling curve, not increasing cardiac output with additional volume. Giving additional fluid in these patients may result in volume overload, which can be harmful in many ways. Volume overload increases cardiac work and can lead to pulmonary edema and an increase in lung water. Additional third spacing may occur, resulting in increased tissue edema, compromising liver and renal function. If the patient is not fluid responsive, additional fluid should be given cautiously, if at all. So how do I use this to take care of patients? You should take care of patients the same way you always have. First, you should be asking, is perfusion okay? Is my patient's blood pressure and other measures of perfusion okay? If they are adequate, no additional therapy may be indicated at that time. Second, if you need to improve perfusion, will additional IV fluid increase cardiac output? Is the patient fluid responsive? This question can best be answered through either a passive leg raise or fluid bolus or monitoring therapy. 
If the patient is fluid responsive, a stroke volume index change of greater than 10% to the challenge, additional fluid is likely to increase cardiac output and improve perfusion. If the patient is not fluid responsive, stroke volume index change of less than 10%, fluid should be administered carefully, if at all, and vasopressors, inotropes, or other agents may be better first-line therapy. Third, optimize perfusion as you always have, balancing volume administration with vasopressors and inotropes as appropriate. Today, you can now do this non-invasively utilizing Cheetah. Congratulations! You have now finished the course. We hope you've enjoyed the course and we welcome your feedback.